Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's start the seminars. Mathieu, please take it away. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks the organizers for uh, inviting me. It's a really a pleasure. So I will talk about um, graph vertex model of 3D cell aggregates. This is a, a, let's say a new reformulation of the vertex model of uh, tissue mechanics uh, that we, um, uh, let's say developed in the past year or so. Uh, the talk is really going to be on more on computational physics part. So it's gonna be rather technical, but I also try to, uh, to prepare it in a more pedagogical way, let's say. Um, Okay, so before I delve into the actual topic of the of the talk, let me first just briefly introduce some other uh, research topics that my group is working on at the moment. So one thing is certainly epithelial uh, elasticity in general, or epithelial wrinkling in particular, where we are trying to understand how single cell mechanics manifest in the tissue scale elastic properties and deformations. Meaning, we describe epithelial monolayers or you know bi biological tissues, let's say at a single cell level uh, using a vertex model, which I will talk about today. And then we coarse grain this uh, model to get a effective uh, continuum um, elasticity theory, and then study different modes of, um, of deformation, such as wrinkling. And then another topic that we're also interested in is dynamics of cell-cell junctions. This is kind of an, at the interface between a molecular scale where you have uh, force generating stochastic processes in the ectomyosin cell cortex. This is where forces are generated. And then we couple this to the cell and tissue scale mechanics, which again, we uh, usually describe by the vertex model. Uh, so we are interested in this kind of feedback loops between uh, these two uh, scales. Uh, and then mechanics of tumors and tumor spheroids. Uh, here we are trying to understand the relation between cell scale mechanics uh, modes of tissue deformation during tumor growth, and then also try to say something about disease prognosis. So how the mechanical, let's say, um, you know, mechanisms of mechanics really uh, can affect uh, the disease outcome. Uh, and then finally, also we are developing different types of uh, computational approaches, and one of them is graph vertex model that I will talk about uh, in this seminar. So the plan is as follows. I will do a bit of introduction first to the epithelial tissues and uh, especially into the vertex models, into the conventional vertex model, I should say. And then I will use this introduction as a motivation to start rethinking the way vertex models are uh, actually um, you know, um, uh, defined, let's say, or, or formulated. Uh, and then I will present you graph vertex model, which is our new formulation of the vertex model. It's based on two concepts that are, I think, quite well known in data science, but maybe a bit less known in our communities, uh, which are knowledge graph and metagraph. Uh, but they're, I would say, quite simple uh, concepts in, in, in their uh, fundamentals. Um, and then I will talk about cell rearrangements, which is um, uh, one of the central things uh, or central motivation why we even started rethinking vertex model. Um, okay, so epithelia, these are uh, one of four types of animal tissues. They usually cover organs. Here I have a sketch of, um, of a single layer epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissues can be also multi-layered like in skin, uh, but here I have just a single layer. And as you see, these are basically surface packings of uh, polyhedral cells. So every polyhedron here is a cell. They don't need to be flat, these tissues, they can be curved, but this the cells are really packed in this surface-like manner. And every cell in the vertex model is described uh, by a polyhedron and its shape is parameterized by positions of vertices, but I will tell you more about this later. Vertex models are just one of the models that, um, uh, that, that describe or study uh, tissue mechanics, um, but probably they're one of the more popular ones, let's say. Um, and this is like, this has been like this for the past 15 plus years, uh, maybe even 20. Uh, and the nice thing about vertex models is that they describe tissue mechanics at the single cell level. So you can actually study how intra and intercellular forces govern tissue scale deformation patterns and cellular flow. So at the same time, you can uh, describe uh, deformations and movements of individual cells, but then also see how this affects the deformations and uh, let's say cellular flows at the larger scale, right? And since I mentioned uh, the flows, right, to even be able to describe flows, you need to um, incorporate in vertex model uh, cell rearrangements because without, you know, having constituents, uh, 
being rearranged, uh, you cannot uh, describe this fluid like uh, behavior. And in tissues, in epithelial tissues where cells are really packed really, really tightly, almost at or even at uh, unit packing fraction, let's say, uh, you would wonder how cells can even rearrange, but they actually rearrange uh, through this so called topological transitions if you view tissues as networks of cell cell interfaces. So, this is a top view on the neighborhood of four cells. You see that uh, two cells um, uh, are separated and they are tethered by this red edge and the other uh, pair of cells, they are neighbors, right? And then this T1 transition happens, which shrinks this edge into a vertex so that in this intermediate state, all four cells share a common vertex. And then a new vertex gets, um, uh, sorry, new edge gets uh, formed in the perpendicular direction relative to the initial direction. So you see the, the two cells that were initially separated now become neighbors and the two cells that were initially neighbors become separated. So this is really, uh, I would say, a unit, uh, you know, building block of cell rearrangement, this T1 transition. And this is just a, T, a 3D render of this, uh, this initial and final state during T1 transition. So once you have this three-dimensional representation of tissues, plus you have cell rearrangements incorporated, you can actually study uh, pretty interesting things. This is from our work from a few years ago, where we studied formation of shapes uh, in uh, miniature organoids. Um, these are miniature organs that are uh, you know, formed in, in the laboratory. Uh, and you see here formation of these interesting uh, like uh, finger-like protrusions. Uh, and if you want to study this kind of three-dimensional deformations, of course, you need to have both 3D representation and at the same time also cell rearrangements implemented in the model. Um, now, actually, when you go to the literature, and these are two nice reviews that I recommend uh, uh, reading for those who are interested in more details about vertex models, you would actually find that most of the literature is actually in the reduced dimensionality approximation. So people don't usually study these full three-dimensional tissues, um, at least not, maybe this is more commonly done now, but uh, um, 10 years ago, maybe there were very few uh, studies like this. Um, and these are there are two kind of approaches when we talk about reduced dimensionality approximations. One is the 2D apical vertex model, where um, we describe uh, these tissues uh, just uh, from the bird's eye view perspective. So these are just packings of uh, polygons in a plane uh, representing cell apical sites. Uh, now, since you have this polygonal representation, you can study how these tissues, uh, how these cells uh, rearrange. You can study this solid fluid like uh, behavior. You can study um, cell sorting, like in this example here. But you cannot study out of plane deformations because simply you don't have the third dimension, right? Um, another representation uh, in 2D is uh, this um, lateral vertex model, where you now cut uh, across the, the tissue in the apicobasal direction, so from the side view, uh, and you get this monolayer becomes actually a one dimensional chain of cell quadrilateral cross sections. Uh, and in this case, you can study out of plane deformations because you have this apicobasal direction, but you don't have any more uh, inform information about um, uh, cell sidedness and you know cell neighborhoods uh, because you don't have this polygonal view, and so you cannot study uh, fluid-like um, you know behavior of these tissues. But you can study out of plane deformations. So this is kind of a very brief overview of let's say vertex model of epithelial tissues. But what we are interested in more are vertex models of 3D cell aggregates. And this is much less explored, um, and I will uh, tell you why in a few seconds. So here we are talking about, instead of just uh, surface-like packings, we are talking about, um, about cell masses, three-dimensional cell masses, where every cell has neighbors all around, okay? And uh, still, just like in any other vertex model, you describe a cell, um, uh, parameterize it through positions of vertices, like you see here. Um, and then you need to tell, um, um, you need to calculate the forces exerted on, on all these vertices, and then you need to solve some dynamic equation to see how these vertices move in space and time. Um, and this is done in this first part, which I will explain now. So you write down basically force balance uh, on, on each vertex, and forces that we typically consider are friction force, conservative forces, and active forces, and they need to sum up to zero. Uh, now you can have different models for the friction. This is a very simple model where you just assume friction with the, with some static ether-like uh, background. Uh, you can have more elaborated model here. 
In this case, it's just uh, some friction coefficient or viscosity, if you will, and you multiply this with the velocity of a vertex and you get friction force. And this is then opposed by conservative forces, which by definition are uh, defined as negative gradient of potential energy. And so by definition, these forces are going to drive the system towards the nearest minimum of the potential energy landscape. But then because tissues are uh, uh, you know, living materials, they are active, you also have these active forces which do the opposite, they drive you away from the uh, local energy minimum. Uh, in the potential energies where you can do your modeling, you can uh, come up with different types of models. So here I'm showing a very simple one where you just have surface energy part and the bulk energy part. In the surface energy part, you um, describe basically uh, adhesion between cells and uh, cell cor uh, cortical tension, and you pack both um, contributions to effective surface tensions uh, acting on every uh, polygon uh, site, uh, on every polygonal site of, of polyhedra. And then you multiply this effective tension on every polygon by its area to get the proper you know, surface energy. And then you sum over all the faces. Uh, the second term basically, uh, uh, prescribe some more or less fixed cell volume. So every cell has some uh, preferred volume. And then if you want to deform cell away from the from its preferred volume, you need to pay some energy for this. And this is because cells are filled with some material that is more or less incompressible. <clears throat> then you have active forces. These are more system specific, I would say. Um, you can have active junction tensions because of activity of myosin. Uh, you can have forces uh, due to cell growth and division and some other forces. Uh, this is really more system specific. Uh, and this part, uh, when we uh, you know, describe vertex dynamics, is actually quite straightforward to implement from the computational physics point of view, or it's at least not much more difficult than in 2D models that I was talking about before. Uh, yeah, you need to do some math. You need to be able to calculate areas and volumes from the positions of vertices. You need to be able to calculate gradients of areas and volumes. But in principle, it can be done, right? But the cell rearrangements part, at least to me, it's much more um, uh, complex, let's say. So this is an analog to T1 transition that I was explaining before, but now in 3D, right? And just because of, you know, convoluted geometry and topology, because it's simply a three-dimensional, you know, um, system, it's just at least if you ask me, it's difficult. And maybe this is the reason why there has been quite little progress since this model was first proposed, which was actually already 20 years ago by Honda and colleagues. And this was the motivation for us to start thinking about, um, uh, well, what we can contribute to, to make this cell rearrangements implementation more uh, uh, easy or straightforward. Now let's talk about this cell rearrangement. So uh, just like in T1 transition, you start with some neighborhood of cells. Here we have five uh, cells. Uh, three of them share this highlighted edge in the, in the middle, C1, C2, and C3. And C4 and C5 are tethered by this highlighted edge. Here below, I'm showing just the polygons, those polygons that either share this highlighted edge. So these are P1, P2, and P3, or they share one of the two uh, vertices of this edge. Uh, just for you know to to um, to better see what's going on, uh, and I'm uh, naming this state E state E for edge, right? And then similarly to T1 transition, this edge gets uh, shrunk into a vertex to get to this V state, and the vertex is here shared by all five uh, cells. And then in T1 transition, you will remember that this vertex now got resolved into an edge, but in this three-dimensional case, it gets resolved into a triangle to get to the T state standing for triangle. So it's edge to vertex to triangle, and you can go back from triangle, merging the three vertices into one vertex and then resolving into uh, this edge, right? Um, and you can also define you know, E to T transition going directly from E to T or T to E going directly from T to E. Um, now, one thing that, that we noticed, and this was probably known before, is that ET and TE transition, so this whole transition from left to right or from right to left, is nothing else but triple T1 transition. How you can see this is that maybe the, it's best seen if you start with a triangle, and now just look at one edge. So if we cho choose this top edge here, we'll see T1 transition, because this edge shrinks into a vertex, and then it resolves into a new edge. And the same stands for the second and the third edge, so it's kind of a triple T1 transition. It's also shown here. So this told me when I was thinking like this, that maybe cell rearrangements should not be so 
difficult to implement because they are just triple T1 transitions and we know in the community how to implement T1 transitions. Uh, but so maybe it's just the data model that is, let's say, not so appropriate in three dimensions that is just so you know difficult to, to kind of, um, let's say, restitch all these elements when such a, a event happens. And so <clears throat> this brings me to the uh, data model that we use. And here I have to say that I'm not sure if everyone in the community uses this type of uh, data model, but we, we use it. Uh, and uh, also Surface Evolver, which is a well-known um, package uh, that is actually has been used now for several decades, mostly in the uh, study of uh, dry foam, uh, also uses something like this. And let me explain you uh, how it works. So you have these two parts. One is cell network geometry part, which just uh, lists basically the vertices of all the cells. Uh, so every line is a vertex, and then you have X, Y, Z uh, coordinates. And then is cell network topology part, where you now need to specify how these vertices connect into edges. Edges are here defined as oriented edges, so they have head and tail vertices. And then how edges uh, connect into polygons, and finally polygons into cells. So these are just arrays, right? In edges, um, uh, for example, edge three, because it's the third line, it's edge three, uh, it connects vertex one and vertex four, and then the sign tells you whether it's head uh, vertex, which is plus, and, or it's tail vertex, which is minus, right? So vertex here is here, uh, vertex four is here, tail vertex in edge three. Uh, and similarly, polygons are defined as lists of oriented edge IDs. So Polygon one here contains uh, edges one, two, four, nine, four hundred and seven, and also for polygons you can define positive orientation. Let's say anti-clockwise in this uh, in this case, and then all the edges that are going to point in the anti-clockwise direction will get this sign sigma plus, and the others will get the sign minus. And similarly for cells, every cell is defined as list of um, of oriented polygon IDs, and polygons they have some normal uh, vector, right? And if this vec normal vector is pointing outwards, by definition, they get plus sign. If they're pointing inwards, they get minus sign. And so this is the data structure that we've been using, uh, at least in our group, for, for, for several year years. Uh, and how do you now perform cell rearrangement? Well, you need to write an algorithm that, uh, that edits this uh, data model or data, this uh, you know, database, let's say. Uh, in a way which is in accordance to the rules of, of these cell rearrangements, right? And this is difficult to do generally, at least to my knowledge, there are no unified algorithms. There are some custom solutions that exist in the literature, um, but, um, but um, they are not so easily reproducible simply because there is no um, proper mathematical algorithm that will tell you how to do step-by-step step, uh, how to perform this cell rearrangement. Uh, and so this is our motivation to rethink the data structure so that cell rearrangements in 3D are going to be uh, implemented in a more straightforward manner. And this brings me to the main concept, which is knowledge graph. This is actually quite simple concept in, in, in uh, at, at its fundamentals is just about representing uh, real world entities and relationships between them by a graph. And uh, if you Google about knowledge graph, Google will tell you that Google itself at least part of it is based on a knowledge graph. They don't tell you exactly how, uh, but I, you can imagine how. So if you, for example, type Tom Hanks in the Google search, you will get, of course, a list of uh, websites where you can learn about uh, Tom Hanks. But then Google will also recommend you some re related searches like Tom Hanks Kids uh, and uh, some movies where Tom Hanks acted in. In this case, it also recommends for some reason Steven Spielberg, who probably directed all these movies. Uh, and in the background, the way I imagine is like this, you have these uh, people, right? Tom Hanks, Elizabeth Hanks, Steven Spielberg, and all these other people uh, uh, represented by notes. And these are these blue notes, but then real world entities are also movies, right? And movies are represented by orange notes here. And then you have relationships of different type, like child of, acted in, directed, right? And then this tells you basically about, this, um, um, about these entities, right? That are represented and their relationships. Uh, and here you see the reason why it recommended Steven Spielberg, because there is obviously a large overlap between Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg because uh, through these movies, right? Uh, so what does this have to do with our tissue? Well, the obvious question here is, would a knowledge graph representation of our tissue be more natural for storing and manipulating tissue data? And uh, this is what we did. So we took this uh, 
array based, let's say, uh, data, structural data model and converted it into a knowledge graph. We didn't add any new data or removed any data. It's just it's the same data, just different representation, right? Uh, and when you when you for, uh, when you formulate knowledge graph, you need to ask yourself what are the real world entities that you represent. These are vertices, edges, polygons, and cells. What is the relationship between them? Is part of right. So this brings me to the meta graph, which is uh, kind of a blueprint of uh, uh, graph vertex model, which means uh, it tells you a rule of how you are allowed to connect uh, nodes to relate to relationships. And this is the, the core of our idea to, to represent data in the following way, in this hierarchical way where you only allow vertices to be connected to edges, edges to polygons and polygons to cells. You don't allow vertices to be connected to cells, for example, even though cells do contain vertices, but if you're interested in vertices of a given cell, you can always query the database through, through this whole path to get from, to, to, to get from cells to, to the vertices. Um, so no redundant data here. So if you would add this additional relationship, uh, this would be redundant, right? Uh, then you also need to store these signs, which are actually contextual properties, if you think about it, because vertex is inherently cannot be head or tail vertex, right? Uh, this headness or tailness is always associated with vertex edge par pair. So that's why we, uh, we uh, store this um, the sigma S and capital sigma on the relationships, which which actually make this pair. Uh, and this is part of this knowledge graph, um, but this is only a chunk of it because uh, in reality you have you can have thousands of nodes, and this is exactly representing the the tissue that I've been showing a few slides ago. Um, okay, so now as a consequence, actually cell rearrangements become quite uh, straightforward to implement. Let's say that you want to do ET transition on this edge that is represented by this node. What you need to do is first you need to do pattern matching, which means that you need to query the database to find the relevant nodes and relationships. So those nodes and relationships that represent entities that get affected by your cell rearrangement events. So these uh, five nodes here, for example, represent the five cells. And then these polygons represent, these nodes, uh, these um, uh, uh, violet nodes here represent the polygons that get affected and so on. And once you have this subgraph, once you, uh, you know, retrieved it from the whole um, knowledge graph, you just need to transform it. And transformation is actually quite simple because it just involves creation of new relationships and deletions of some older relationships. And you get from, from the initial state to the final state. And the nice thing is that you can represent this graph transformation also by a graph, and this is our invention. You, this graph actually contains exactly the same nodes as the initial and the final state, but uh, it contains this time two different relationships, which are red and green. Red relationship indicates which relationships need to be deleted through this transformation, and the green relationships uh, indicate which relationships need to be created uh, du du uh, during this um, transformation. And then you also need to tell how the contextual properties transform, but that's, uh, that's, uh, that's important for the purpose of this talk. And then you can define the blueprint of how uh, graph transformation graph is, uh, is uh, allowed to be formed. Um, okay, so then we derived uh, all graph transformations for all these uh, different uh, topological transitions that are involved in cell rearrangements in 3D. I'm here just showing E to T and T to E. So these are on the left hand side, you have the initial states in both cases here E and here T, and then the final states. And here in the middle, you have uh, the rules of how you need to um, uh, you know, delete and create relationships to perform this transformation. And then you also need to specify how contextual properties change. This looks a bit complicated, but in reality, you can actually uh, derive some formulas that give you this directly. Um, and this, you can see it as now as a mathematical formulation or a mathematical algorithm that tells you exactly how a database um, uh, gets transformed when uh, some cell rearrangement happens. And then you can get some insights from this actually. First of all, this, is a, uh, this would be a graph transformation which represents T1 transition in 2D. Uh, it actually contains four uh, creations and four deletions of relationships. And you can find these kind of patterns inside these uh, graph transformation graphs because of what I told you at the beginning of the talk that ET and TE transitions look like just triple T1 transitions and that's why you find these patterns here. 
Uh, but more importantly, you can actually use these uh, graph transformations that we developed in 3D, and you can apply them directly to a two-dimensional model of polygonal packings. And these both transformations that I'm showing here are going to reduce exactly to a T1 transition, which kind of unifies uh, topological transitions in 2D and 3D space filling packings and tells that our knowledge graph representation may be, I would say, well, uh, maybe the most natural way to represent these systems, but we don't have proof for this, right? Um, okay, so we uh, also implemented uh, graph vertex modeling in a Python package, which we named uh, NeoVM, and it's uh, freely available on GitLab. Here is the link. Uh, its core is written in Python, but it also relies on database management framework called Neo4j, which uses Cypher, uh, which is a graph query language. Um, okay, so this brings me to the end. So. Uh, to summarize, we reformulated the vertex model and we named this reformulation graph vertex model. Uh, the basic idea of it is actually quite simple. It's just that you need to store uh, in this knowledge graph uh, the entities and relationships in a hierarchical way so that vertex connects to edge, edge to polygon, and polygon to cell, and, and that's it. And as a consequence, it turns out that cell rearrangements in this kind of uh, database are quite easy to implement. And at least to my knowledge, this is the first ever proper and really intuitive mathematical definition of cell rearrangement or, or some kind of algorithm, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, we got some insights from this. One is that ET and T transitions are composites of triple T1 transitions. And more importantly, that our transformations that we define are general and are applicable both to 3D and to 2D. And in 2D, they uh, reduce to a T1 transition. Uh, this is my group. Uh, most of the work was done by uh, Tanmo and my postdoc inspiration we got from um, when I collaborated with this company, Wisdom Labs, uh, uh, a year ago. Uh, this is, was in private sector. Uh, with them, we actually worked on um, some business analytics. Uh, and I told you that in data science, uh, uh, this knowledge graph concept is quite well known. So that's where I learned all this. And then uh, the fun funding was provided by Slovenia and the Research and Innovation Agency. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matej, for a wonderful talk. So there are some questions. So first, there is a comment by uh, Rabine, and maybe this we can have a discussion more on this during the informal uh, Q&A. So Rabine was saying, your graph looks a bit like those shown in machine learning. And then there are two questions. I'll go to the questions right away. So there is a question from Andre Zakharov. And Andre is saying, can you provide insights on how to incorporate pressure gradients, fluid and osmotic in the 3D model? This might be useful for describing cell layering in cell spheroids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, I'm not sure if uh, is he or she uh, asking uh, about how to incorporate in the graph or in the vertex model itself. Andre, you can unmute yourself and ask directly if you're here. It's in the vertex model. Mm -hmm. um, pressure gradients inside cells or in, in whole uh, like tumors or tumor spheroids? In cells. Mm -hmm. Because a pressure in some sort, right, of some sort is already implemented, let's see, uh, through this uh, term, which is conservation of volume, right? This is kind of, well, it's not pressure, it's it's uh, it's uh, uh, modulus, right? But this kind of gives you this interplay between volume and, uh, and uh, yeah, pressure. Uh, but... All you can do in vertex models is kind of incorporate this in the in the potential energy. So if you're you know able to describe it through a potential energy, then then you're good to go. Otherwise, it's this these kind of concepts are I would say more difficult to implement in the vertex model. But this is just general answer to to this okay. question. Yeah, yeah, Thank, and and again you know, we can have a more discussion in, in the Q and A. Thank you, uh, Mate. And then there's a question from Martin. And he's asking, is there still a system of Cartesian coordinates to represent your model? Or is this model only used to study the topology of the system? Uh, so the, the answer is the following. So we, it could be, so it's still, of course you still have positions of vertices, but uh, I only showed the, the part of the knowledge graph which contains the topological part. That's why I 
the, this orange, you know, uh, transformation. So this part, the blue part, which talks about geometry, is still in our code, if you if you will, still stored in in this array like manner. But it could be also incorporated in the knowledge graph. You could, for example, have the properties of these vertices of these vertex nodes, which would be x, y, and z coordinates. It's just it, uh, uh, this was not really our intention because the difficult part here is not to change the coordinates during the uh, cell rearrangement event, but to change the topology. That's why we only um, store the topological part. But in principle, you could do you could store the whole uh, information, including the geometry. Okay, and I guess he had a follow up question: uh, Was do you have examples of biological systems you were able to model? Uh, well, we intend to model uh, 3D cell masses, which usually would be tumors and tumor spheroids um, with this 3D model. But you could use exactly the same approach on any you know, previous version of vertex models that I was talking about, either 3D uh, surface you know, vertex model or um, 2D, uh, uh, this reduced dimensionality approximations. Uh, you could implement all of them in, with this kind of approach. Thank you. So I think, Matej, we will thank you again for a wonderful yeah. talk and we'll take thank more you. questions for you at the, at the end of, you know, both talks. So thank you again. And with that, I think